Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another vlog with me, Chris Hutting, project manager here at the Free Market Foundation. I'm coming to you on today, the 5th of September, already in September, uh, here from Johannesburg, very hot Johannesburg, um, in more ways than one. I'm sure most of you know about, or have read about the xenophobic attacks happening in Johannesburg and Pretoria in the last week or so, uh, very sad events and occurrences happening in our country at the moment, along with a whole host of other issues. Uh, one cannot deny that we live in an interesting country. You know, I think that's <laughs> that's quite evident. Um, so this week on my vlog, I wanted to talk about two things, the xenophobic attacks and also some news um, around South African airways. So we'll start with the xenophobic attacks. Um, I wrote an article about Minister Tito Mboweni's new economic plan that we sent out yesterday. You can find that on our website and it has been republished in a few places, but if you're interested in reading, in reading that, please go to our website and you can find it there. Um, and then just in, in that article, I, I draw the link to the lack of economic growth and the xenophobic attacks that we're currently seeing. Um, now, you should always keep in mind that events such as these attacks, they never happen in isolation. There's always one or probably a few causes. I think a, a big cause for what we're seeing at the moment is that people have been taught and told for years and years and years by politicians that their own struggles and hardships are caused by other people, you know, be they other people in a different race group or be they foreigners or be they, you know, take your pick. There's always a target on whom politicians try and place the blame uh, for their own, the failings of their own policies. Now, South Africa has been on the path of low growth, um, high taxes, redistribution of wealth, um, restrictive and punitive regulations for many years um, during apartheid and post apartheid. And we're seeing the effects of those policies because they're premised on the notion that the state should control the economy and that the state should dictate to people where they should spend their money on what, um, where their money should go. And they also place the state at the center of, of our lives. They presume, these policies presume that the state must take care of us and look after us and, and do everything for us from healthcare to food, to water, every other necessity you might need, uh, data as well, recently. Now, when you teach people and uh, get them used to um, relying on the state, when services fail, then they're going to demand what they think is their right. And I think given that context that people have been told this for years and years and years, this reaction should not be a surprise and we shouldn't, you know, be, um, we shouldn't think that this has just come about for no reason. Uh, we've told we've told people for very long now that the state is their their parent and the the wellspring of everything they need in life, and then when they don't get it and they see other people who might have some sort of economic success and wealth and progress, they're going to attack them because they assume those people have taken those resources from them. They believe those things are their right, and they will attack people who they think have um, have neglected them and have taken away from them what should rightly be theirs. Uh, that's their view. Um, I think a lot of these policies also assume that individual agency, individual responsibility and economic growth are, you know, sort of niceties to have, but not really should not be the main focus of one's life. Whereas from my perspective, um, we each have a wealth pie. We each make decisions with our money, with our time, with our resources, with our skills. And those decisions that we make, those affect the money and the, the wealth and the property that we have. Sometimes we make the wrong decisions and we have to live with the consequences. Uh, now, a lot of more left-leaning government-backed or government-imposed views and policies have the view that the wealth in a country is fixed, that it's a fixed uh, pie and that it should be redistributed, redistributed amongst the people, but that wealth never grows. It's simply there and it should be redistributed, which to me is patently wrong. Each person's wealth is his or her own responsibility and up to him or her to grow as best as he or she can in a free market. Now, given the spate of uh, tenders we have in the country of restrictive laws, um, people nowadays have to go uh, to government to get government favors to grow their wealth. And that to me is not morally right. That's not how things should be done. People should be free to compete with each other on an open market and stand or fail on their own two feet. 
And that hasn't happened now for many years, unfortunately. Um, so I don't, yeah, just to sort of wrap it all up, people are not seeing economic growth. They're not seeing progress. Um, they feel that their lives are very restricted and held down. And in many ways they are. And in South Africa, as it has for centuries, these government policies have the most negative effect on poor black South Africans because their options are much more limited than the options of white people, uh, Indian people, um, Chinese people. Those groups have much more flexibility in how they can use their skills and what they've learned and their wealth um, as compared to black South Africans who have been downtrodden by the state for centuries and centuries. And when they hit out at different targets, it's the result of frustration and anger. Um, if we pursued a path of economic growth, of individual freedom, of, um, of responsibility, of letting people use, their, use what they've learned, their skills, to trade with each other, to grow their wealth, um, I think we won't be seeing the social tension that we're seeing at the moment. Um, we need to get rid of this sort of view that wealth is fixed, that it must be redistributed by the state, that only the state can give us what we need. Uh, we need to place much more individual agency and responsibility back in the hands of individual people instead of forcing them to folk to to give their lives and control over to the state all the time um, yeah and and hopefully then we'll we'll see some sort of um, alleviation of these issues but i think for as long as we follow the sort of the the path of group think state control um, stuff like that redistribution we'll keep seeing these social problems because People have no opportunities to grow their own wealth. This in no way justifies the xenophobic attacks that we've been seeing. I think any violence perpetrated against someone else is morally wrong, unless you're doing it in re retaliation for an attack on you. Um, but to think that foreign people coming to South Africa, um, operating shops and, and, and earning a living, that that, that that in some way takes away what South Africans themselves can do for their lives, I think is completely wrong, uh, wrong headed and the wrong way of thinking about things and looking at things. Uh, trading with people, people who come here, uh, that enriches our lives, it enriches the economy, it strengthens the economy. Uh, more trade is always good for for society. Uh, the, the division of labor is good, it, it lowers the costs of goods and services. And I think that's a, a very good thing for South Africans and for foreign people coming to South Africa. We're also now seeing the ripple effects of the xenophobic attacks here in other countries across Africa. And Africa, I think, should pursue a path of trade, not of um, different countries acting as silos, uh, fighting against each other and, and seeing each other as, as enemies. Uh, trade is mutually beneficial. It should be win-win. Otherwise, why would you trade with someone? It's built into the concept of trade that it should be a win-win. Uh, and we should start seeing it in that light. All right, now I'll move on to the second topic for this week. Um, on this vlog, we're talking about SAA, South African Airways, that other favorite SOE in South Africa. Um, there's news this morning, so on, on this uh, Thursday morning, that uh, the British, uh, a British airline expert, Peter Davies, he is set to step down as the chief restructuring officer of SAA. Now, I've lost count of the number of turnaround uh, officers and strategies and everything else that SAA and CEOs that they've had. Um, this is just another example of why SAA is such in, a bad, in such a bad state and why it should be closed down at this point. Um, no one person can turn this thing around. I don't think a board can turn this, one, this thing around or any number of people on the team. SAA is in such a bad state that it's time for it to be, to be shut down and closed down. Davies was appointed less than two years ago. Apparently, he'll remain as an advisor to the board while they seek a new full-time chief restructuring officer. Uh, Davies was formerly head of Air Malta and Brussels Airlines. Uh, he has been based in the UK during his tenure um, with SAA. The spokesperson for SAA, Klali Klali, said on Wednesday that the airline had advertised the position of the CRO to enable the successor to, to assume the responsibilities held by Davies. And then lenders also had required that a CRO be put in place at the airline. It is now also a condition of the Treasury that a CRO be appointed in state-owned enterprises that receive government bailouts. Well, while I agree with that, and I think that's a great idea, and I'm glad they put that sort of provision in, it clearly hasn't had any sort of material effect and hasn't worked at all. Uh, SAA is simply a, a black hole into which taxpayer money has been thrown. So at this point, the fact that they are keeping it afloat and flying in the air to me is a moral travesty. If you look at the problems in the country at the moment and government 
talks about poverty alleviation, social grants, stuff like that, to think that they're also now using that money that they could be using on those programs to bail out SOEs such as SAA and ESCOM, to me is a moral travesty. Um, there's no reason for us to have SAA. I know they talk about, sometimes they talk about pride and having a flag carrier. I don't think you can have any pride in SAA. If you need to bail out uh, a company, you can't have pride in it. It has failed on its own terms. If SAA was a private airline, it would have closed down long ago or been bought by a competitor, as ought to be the case. Um, SAA doesn't have to be subject to normal market forces like a normal airline because it has government guarantees of, of um, funding whenever it needs them. So there's no reason for it to, to effectively implement a turnaround strategy because it knows it can simply go to government with its begging bowl and the government will give it another bailout. This is never going to result in any sort of turnaround for SAA. It's never going to break even. It's never going to turn a profit. And at this point, it really should be shut down. Uh, there was an article, I think, last week by Feral Hefeji talking about the um, the growth of Emirates, Emirates Airline and Ethiopian Airlines in Africa and how they've taken so much of what used to be SAA's market share and how much SAA could have grown had it been managed properly. Now, of course, due to corruption, um, um, state capture, all these allegations now uh, floating around of who was involved with SAA and how that all tied back to the, the whole state capture saga, the bigger issue. Um, when you give government the sort of control over anything, the possibility for abuse is much bigger um, because the, the pool of resources is bigger and people know if they get involved, if they get that tender, they'll be safe pretty much for life. They'll get as much money as they need from the South African taxpayer for as long as there are taxpayers, of course, and we know that there are fewer and fewer of those, more people are leaving these shores because they see what's happening to them, taxes that they pay. I think many people, most people have no problem with paying taxes if those taxes are used properly. And in South Africa, that is definitely not the case. We're seeing this pretty much every day in how they abuse taxpayer money um, for their own gain, how they don't use the money properly in ways that they said they would. Um, and we shouldn't be surprised because they simply don't feel accountable. Uh, especially not the SAA board. Just to wrap up on um, SAA, so it needs, it's holding out for a 3.5 billion rand bailout from Treasury once the special appropriation bill has been processed and signed by President Ramaphosa, which I hope he doesn't, but he probably will. Uh, the bailout will be used to repay short-term bridging finance raised by the airline in January. In addition to the bailout, SAA requires another 4 billion rand to cover its working capital for 2019-2020 and must either roll over or repay 9.2 billion rand of debt at the end of this month. Um, I'm really hoping that the lenders are very cautious in this, especially the banks. Um, they must be very, very wary of giving money to SAA. Uh, in some ways, I think they have a moral obligation not to give money to SAA because of the money, how because of its track record, how it abuses the ballots that it receives. Um, I'm hoping that at some point they can maybe give up a partial sale of the airline and that government can give up its majority stake. Hopefully that'll be some sort of sign in the right direction. I know Minister Tito Mboweni has in the past um, spoken out quite strongly and harshly on SAA and how he wishes it, it would be privatized. So maybe we'll see that in the future. Um, but yeah, that was just to give you guys a little bit of an update on, on the whole SAA story and what's going on there. Um, hopefully financial reality sets in at some point sooner rather than later all right i'll end it on that note thank you all very much for watching and listening thank you uh, for supporting our work what we do here at the fmf if, if you if you uh, find value in what we do please consider becoming a donor or a member you can find all of that information on our website www.freemarketfoundation.com please follow our work on both facebook and twitter uh, obviously please subscribe to this youtube channel where you're watching this video please share all of our articles and videos um, please leave your comments and uh, like and share um, this video with all your friends let them know about what we do um, and consider supporting us in other ways as well i'll talk to you all again soon i hope you have a good week ahead bye